Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're going to get started with our, our last panel of the day, where we're going to zoom back out from um, the details of implementation to talk about some broader themes around justice and data and justice and data access. Um, I'm here to just introduce the moderator who will then introduce our panel panelists. Um, unfortunately, uh, Warren couldn't make it today. Um, so uh, we'll have a smaller panel with more chances for all of us to engage. Um, so our moderator is Aletra Bietti, uh, who's an expert on the regulation of digital technologies, data, and digital platform intermediaries. She joined the Northeastern faculty um, in 2023 as an assistant professor of law and computer science. Um, and uh, Professor Bietti was previously a joint fellow at the Information Law Institute at NYU, the Digital Life Initiative at Cornell Tech in New York. Um, she holds an SJD and LLM from Harvard Law School, an LLB from University College London, and a postgraduate diploma in IP law and practice from Oxford University. She's a faculty associate with the Berkman Klein Center here, um, and is an affiliated fellow at the Information Society Project at Yale Law School. Um, so Electra has many levels of expertise and is a very well-traveled um, academic. So thank you, Electra, for moderating our panel, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, so I'm delighted to be here and to introduce our two panelists today. And I'm sorry that one of our, the third panelists could not be here. Um, maybe she's online, I don't know. Um, so the first uh, panelist um, and the first speaker in this panel is Ulysses Mejas. Um, hope to have pronounced it correctly. He's a professor of communication. For, no, is the answer. Uh, professor of communication studies at SUNY um, Osvego in Osvego County, New York. He's a co-founder of Tierra Común, a network of activists, educators, and scholars who work towards the decolonization of data. He serves on the board of Humanities New York, and he has co-authored. Um, most recently, a book with our very own Nick Coldry. The title of the book is Data Grab, The New Colonialism of Big Tech and How to Fight Back. Our other panelist is Aziz Hook. He is a Frank and Bernice J. Greenberg Professor of Law at the University of Chicago Law School. Um, his work focuses on US and comparative constitutional law. He has done very interesting work in the data, privacy, data governance space around data trusts. Uh, before joining the law school at Chicago, Professor Hook was counsel and then director of the Brennan Center's Liberty and National Security Project, litigating cases in both the US Courts of Appeals and the Supreme Court. Um, he's clerk and uh, many other things. Um, and so I'm going to open it up um, to the two speakers, first Ulysses and then Aziz, and then we'll kind of have a bit of a Q&A. Um, I might add a few thoughts on the right to information, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, in some ways, I guess I feel uh, a little bit like I'm crashing this workshop in the sense that Obviously, all of the topics that have been discussed so far are very important and very relevant to my work, but I'm not an expert on any of those topics. Um, my work or the lens that I use to um, look at uh, many of these issues is the lens of colonialism. And so um, it is from that perspective that I will, uh, if you will allow me, offer some comments. Um, the gist of which will be I think to kind of question a little bit this notion of the rights uh, in terms of the right to information, why frame it as a right, um, a right that can lead to certain freedoms. So I want to question uh, this notion, uh, especially um, from the perspective of colonialism uh, and the concept that Nick and I have developed of data colonialism. Um, which I will describe very briefly for you. But I am interested in this notion of how uh, colonialism uh, is a system of lawlessness. So even to talk about uh, our rights, I think it's, a, it's an interesting tension there. Uh, after all, uh, what rights 
did the colonized subjects have? None. Um, are rights even relevant to the process of decolonization? So those are kind of like the questions that uh, I want to begin um, uh, to discuss. So like I said, I will just give you kind of like the five minute at most uh, introduction to data colonialism um, that Nick and I have developed in our work. And we basically, I think it's very important from the start to establish that we're not using the word colonialism as a metaphor, because I think people can uh, um, be excused thinking that uh, maybe what we mean is that by describing uh, what's happening with data in our world today as colonialism, maybe we just mean that metaphorically or allegorically. We're not saying that. We're actually arguing that what we're seeing is an emerging social system that uh, can very much be described as a new way, a new form of colonialism. Basically, we've gone from a land grab to a data grab. The previous forms of colonialism obviously were interested in grabbing territory, natural resources, labor. Uh, data colonialism is about grabbing data. Uh, data extracted continuously from our lives for one purpose only, which is the generation of wealth which of course, uh, as with previous forms of colonialism, brings with it all of these uh, issues of um, justice and uh, equality, etc. Uh, so we're not saying data is bad. We're not saying we're against data. Uh, we're very specifically targeting this notion, targeting this notion of uh, um, data continuously extracted from our social lives. Um, that process of abstraction itself uh, being how data is formed and used very specifically to gen generate wealth. Um, of course, as soon as we start to talk about colonialism, um, you might also have questions about, well, how is this, um, um, isn't it very different from all, all previous forms of colonialism? And that is indeed the case. There are lots of differences between historic colonialism and data colonialism in terms of the scales, in terms of the context, the modalities. Of course, even if we start to think about colonialism in Mexico, where I'm from, versus colonialism in India, versus other forms of colonialism we might be seeing in the news today. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of differences between all of those and data colonialism. But there is one key similarity um, that we see, and that is the function across all of these forms of colonialism, the function is the same, and that function is to extract. That function is to dispossess. So that's why we attempt to look at what's happening with data in this long historical arc of dispossession. Um, another question that might be asked is, well, why aren't we just describing this in terms of capitalism? You know, and there are various proposals to understand what's happening in terms of data capitalism, surveillance capitalism. Uh, aren't those models enough? And not to go into a lot of detail, but we are saying basically that they're not. That we need to understand, there's no way to understand capitalism without understanding its influence, you know, through colonialism. Um, it's kind of like a double helix. And um, the wealth accumulation that happened in capitalism would not have been possible without uh, uh, colonialism and without the plantations. You know, so if you want to think about it simplistically, uh, the plantations finance the factories. And um, both capitalism and colonialism, we see them as co-evolving. So um, I won't get into uh, the specifics of the model. In our work, we talk about, we try to organize it in terms of the 4X model, uh, which is basically explore, expand, exploit, and exterminate. That's actually a model uh, that uh, we use uh, when we play strategy video games. And so we try to follow each one of those Xs, um, look at how they apply in contemporary life. But as you might have gathered, uh, data colonialism is kind of a, a, a meta theory. We're trying to propose something that allows us to explain um, everything, uh, not just ads, not just cookies, uh, but uh, AI, what's happening in AI uh, as a model of extractivism as well, what's happening with cryptocurrency, what's happening with algorithmic bias. So yes, uh, in some ways it's a, 
trying, it's a theory of everything, trying to explain what's happening. Uh, I'm trying to explain it also by looking at the different data territories that are created. So yes, the extraction is no longer about uh, natural resources, it's about these new data territories. And so we start to think about ag tech, agricultural technology, ed tech, educational technology, health tech. Each one of these is kind of like a new data territory where certain corporations are um, devising uh, new ways of extracting data from us. If we look at Bosware um, to monitor workers, if we look at smart borders, if we look at smart weapons. Um, so again, data colonialism tries to explain all of those things. Um, why is all of this relevant to uh, um, the right to information? Um, I've been learning a lot from the previous panels about even just the distinction between, or how we define uh, public, uh, public goods. And I know you're going to say a little bit more about that. But um, I think it's interesting to think about rights also in the context of colonialism as things that were always supposed to apply to certain um, subjects and not others. So even uh, after colonialism ended, and of course we can disagree about whether colonialism is actually over or not, um, after colonies got their independence and went through different processes of so sovereignty, uh, the process was always about defining a citizen with certain kinds of rights and other people who kind of fell, you know, outside of uh, those rights and privileges. So, um, of course, today, um, uh, whereas before, the idea was that uh, nature and territory was, were rendered as cheap, today we have cheap data, which shares many of those same attributes. Data is said to just be there for the taking. Colonizers can come along and appropriate it. So cheap data functions the same way. Uh, in some ways, I think we've been living through a new tragedy of the commons, tragedy of the data commons, in the sense that our contributions to all of this, uh, we were told to contribute to uh, the internet and platforms because all of this was going into a big pool of uh, um, you know common resources. And of course, we found out that, that uh, those resources were being privatized and we are facing the consequences of all of that. Um, but yes, uh, I just to wrap up my comments, I think uh, we do definitely need different kinds of epistemic entitlements, as uh, Lisa describes them, um, precisely because uh, the costs of data colonialism, as the costs of historic colonialism, are not evenly distributed. There's always certain populations that pay a heavier price. And of course, when we think about the legacy of colonialism, that uh, um, you know, amounts to looking at issues of race, gender, and class. Um, and so, yes, I think uh, um, uh, that's why I'm interested in this, sort of trying to understand this question of rights from a colonial perspective. Um, uh, if we look at the colonial history of rights and freedoms and how they applied to some, but not to all. So I think with that, I will sort of stop my explanation and uh, see if it exists. I, I want to start off by thanking Lisa and the other organizers at Ulysses for that terrific um, and, and, and really important uh, uh, ground setting and, and, and exploration of both descriptive issues earlier in the day and then the conceptual issues of data colonialism that we just heard from Ulysses. It's really terrific. Uh, uh, and I hope that my intervention, which I think is a kind of small bore application of some of the the, the more general idea is that Ulysses just put on the table is uh, a helpful extension. Uh, so my, my work on these issues comes about through uh, a series of papers uh, that I uh, have been working on since about 2019 on how the substitution of machine learning tools into uh, contexts in which the state is acting against private parties changes the way we think about individual rights. What does it mean to have due process or privacy against a machine as opposed to a human being. Um, and thinking about those questions led me to think about how data is accessed and managed for the obvious reason that the availability of many forms of computational inference 
depend upon the existence and access to and the ability to exploit uh, data. Uh, and and um, in thinking through that, I've, I've pursued a couple of different academic projects. Uh, one of them is the, the one that I'm going to talk about today, which is the idea of the public trust in personal data. Uh, another, which is ongoing, is a uh, uh, thinking through the way in which government architectures its own data collection and retention. Uh, so I have a forthcoming paper with Zach Thompson at uh, uh, Northwestern uh, on uh, how data is aggregated and exploited by the federal court system here in the United States. Uh, and I think that's, a, that's an interesting topic because it goes to some of the questions about whether there is a clear distinction between the public and the private that we've touched upon this morning. Uh, but the, the piece of the, the project that I want to spin out today concerns how the personal data created through individual interactions with platforms, with websites, with various physical elements of the Internet of Things uh, should be uh, managed. How should it be handled? Um, and the core of the proposal is this, at least in the United States, um, I think that uh, both states and municipalities should create freestanding legal entities called public trusts. A trust is a legal entity uh, that has a set of fiduciary duties in respect to the management of an asset. The proposal is, is that data that is generated within the jurisdiction must be with uh, uh, must be owned by the trust. The trust is established by statute. The statute creates certain limitations upon how the data can be employed or certain positive obligations with respect to the deployment of the data. And that implementing legislation further establishes a set of instruments for enforcing the limitations upon the trust's deployment of the data. So the idea is to aggregate, to place the, uh, the uh, uh, data in a, in a separate legal entity that is a state-owned trust, and to have that trust uh, be, be operated subject to uh, 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 enforceable obligations respecting how the data can or cannot be used. So that's the core idea. There's a couple of versions of, the, of uh, municipal level regulation that are already in existence that have traces of this idea. Uh, in Barcelona, there is a, a platform called Decidem, which is uh, which requires that uh, or which under which uh, any company operating in Barcelona and collecting personal data has to, in particular locational data, has to uh, share that data with Decidem, and then Decidem gets to use that data for uh, a range of different public services. Similarly, since 2019, New York City has had a statute that requires ride-sharing platforms, Uber and Lyft, uh, to disclose data on the times, dates, locations, and, and drop-offs of pickups uh, down to the intersection. That data is largely used for, uh, for the purpose of planning traffic uh, patterns and planning for the provision of public transit. So those, those are instances in which the state is in part taking some measure of control over data uh, and directing how it can be used, although it's not preventing the private companies from using that data in other ways. Uh, and my proposal would go beyond what Barcelona and New York does and uh, limit the ways in which private companies use data. Um, so why, why approach this question uh, through uh, a paradigm of ownership rather than a paradigm of rights? I think the way into that is by saying, who owns data now? Or answering the question, who owns personal data now? And then answering the question, who should own personal data? So who owns the, uh, the data that is generated by your phones, your Fitbits, what have you? Um, it's easy to think that that data is owned by the platforms. Uh, and indeed, as a matter of uh, the de facto organization of the world, the data is held on, on cloud computers that are the physical property of the platform. Access to those mainframes is controlled by trespass law, 
by trade secrets law and by various contractual obligations on the part of employees. So it's a matter of positive law, the data is under the control of the private entities. But that data is a matter of at least American constitutional law, in my view, cannot be owned by the company. Why is that? First, the data is an intangible property. It's not, it's not real property like the land we're sitting on or the this, uh, 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 chapels like this table. Intangible property in the United States is created pursuant to the intellectual property clause of the American Constitution. The Supreme Court, since the beginning of the 20th century, has said that there are constraints that flow from the Constitution on what can be intangible property under the intellectual property clause. For example, in a case concerning a dispute between the Associated Press and a competing news agency called INS, the court held that facts question or in, intangible property that takes the form of information about things in the world fell outside the domain of what could be subject to either patent or copyright. Facts cannot be subject to a property regime, at least in the United States. And what is personal data except for a very large compilation of facts? So, so in this peculiar way, there is this optical illusion of ownership of data by platforms and the like. Now, obviously, the, you know, if you, if you, the, the people who work for platforms, the, the regulators who are interacting with the platforms have no incentive to point out this, what I think when you see it is a, is a rather gaping logical flaw in the legal structure of the platform economy. So that's the first point. So who should own data? How should data, how should the control and access rights with respect to data be allocated? Um, so since the early 1970s, there have been a series of proposals to uh, assign control rights over data to individuals. Uh, my view is that these proposals, the most recent of which was put forward by my colleague, uh, Eric Posner with Glenn Weil, uh, have persistently failed, and they persistently failed for good reason. They persistently failed because the epistemic and the cognitive requirements for managing personal data at the level of the individual are far greater than even the well-educated, reasonably culturally endowed person, the Harvard Law School graduate, let's say, can manage, let alone uh, a set of demands that um, somebody without the same level of epistemic, social and cultural uh, resources can manage. So for, I think for well-trodden reasons, an individualized model of control just does not work. And advocating, I think, for it has a kind of neoliberal feel that has the same outcomes as many other forms of neoliberal control and market mechanisms. This, I think, is a connection to uh, coming back to and connecting to some of the things that Ulysses uh, talks about. Um, so instead, um, my view is that there's, there's a need for a collective management mechanism um, we actually have a set of instruments for managing collective resources or producing what the economist would call a collective public good, something that is non-rivalrous and non-excludable. This is a form of a public good, which is related to a public good. Um, and it's called the state. And, and in democracies, we have a set of mechanisms for regulating and limiting and channeling the state in ways that we collectively decide upon. And so the state, to my mind, is the natural, the obvious locus for the collective control and uh, access regimes. The public trust, I use that phrase earlier, the public trust is the way that this has historically been done in Anglo-American law. So the public trust idea is a very old one. It goes back to medieval law. There were in, in medieval England there were there were commonses, uh, some some clothes, right? Another connection to the history of capitalism and colonialism. Uh, some some clothes, it was treated as public trusts. 
The public trust concept, though, was revived in the progressive era in the United States and was used as an instrument to mitigate the effect of or the, uh, the supervening <coughs> political power of trusts. Here's an example. I live in Chicago. In Chicago, there's a whole bunch of very, very valuable land that runs across the eastern strip of Lake Michigan. That land uh, is held in public trust. In the late 1800s, the city of Chicago tried to sell that land to a railroad company. Right? They tried to sell it to a railroad company called the Illinois Central. And a members of the public brought suit, first in Illinois court, but it went all the way up to the Supreme Court, uh, challenging the validity of that sale. And their argument was, this land is held in public trust. That means that the state has a fiduciary responsibility to manage and control the land in ways that benefit the citizens of Chicago and Illinois today and into the near term. Selling this land to the Illinois Central Railroad is a violation of that trust. It is a way of maximizing private profit, private profit but it is not a way of maximizing the smooth a return or creation of public goods over time. And they won. Um, so that model of the public trust has been picked up and used in many parts of the United States to manage common resources. It's been used to manage many, um, not, not just riverine and lakeside land, but actual water bodies of water. Uh, there's some really interesting cases about um, natural resources such as fisheries. Uh, and, and oyster beds that have been subject to public trust uh, management. All of those cases have generated a body of law that provides at least some off the shelf rules for thinking about how to manage or how to regulate collectively owned resources. Um, I, now, obviously, I don't think that you can take a set of legal rules that are designed for Chicago beaches or I think it was New York oysters. Uh, and, and transpose them without modification to the context of data. I, I, clearly, that's not right. Clearly, the, the conceptual uh, uh, porting is at a relatively high level of generalization, of generality, and you have to add in a bunch of details which are specific to the, um, excuse me, which is specific to the data context. Let me, let me offer, in closing, three, I think, details of how in my view, a public trust with respect to data ought to work. The first is that, I, I, in my view, what's important is that the state be the, excuse me, the, the state-owned trust be the beneficial owner of the data. I do not think that the state needs either to hold the data on servers that are controlled or owned by the state, or as in the data nationalization measures that you see in places like China, that the state itself needs to have access to the data. Right? You can be the owner of something and it can be held by somebody else. This is simple concept of property local available. Um, so that's the first point. You can, you can you absolutely you can have the data held on the server. You know, if it's data from for, for Cambridge Mass citizens, it can be held in Iceland, it doesn't matter, right? Still uh, the Cambridge Trust for Data, let's say, is the beneficial owner. They get to say how and when that data is used. And I would say that there are two kinds of rules that a data trust ought to have. The first uh, is akin to the Barcelona and the New York examples. A data trust ought to identify positive ways in which data can be leveraged or ought to be leveraged for the generation of public goods. So, for example, New York identifying places where there is a need for public transportation, there's a need for buses to go, but they don't go now. I think is a classic use of a uh, of data to generate what everyone regards as a public good. So I think there should be a set of positive obligations with respect to the uh, to the good. Second, I think that the uh, the the trust should impose constraints upon the ways in which private actors who have collected the data can use the data. Right. I, I think of this as akin to railroad regulation back in, again, in the progressive era, where the, 
the trust, let's say the Cambridge Trust, says to the entity collecting data in Cambridge, yes, sure, you can use this data, you can use it to improve your algorithm, you can use it to sharpen your recommender tool, but maybe you can't sell it to some other company, maybe you can sell it to certain kinds of companies but not other kinds of companies, uh, maybe uh, uh, we require you to destroy it after a certain length of time. Right? I, I, I'm agnostic about the particular rules, but the idea is, is that private, private deployments of data for profit would be constrained. Right? And I think this, is, this again goes to the sort of the, 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 data, the, the, the data commercialism or the, or the, the data colonialism point and resisting the, the model of colonialism. Um, I, the final point that I would make, and I think again connecting it to the data colonialism discussion, is I, when I wrote the paper, I, I was very much thinking about what can be done in the United States, and I, I think that um, for both good and bad reasons, legal scholars are often constrained by their immediate political circumstances, and so I, I didn't suggest that one could have a national uh, data trust in part because I, you know, I, you know, Congress can't do anything. This is quite complicated. Clearly, Congress can't do it. So proposing state or local level measures seem to be the only feasible, practicable way forward that would not have people laughing in my face. Our particular psychodramas of national legislation are distinctive to the United States. They don't apply in other places, and there's no reason why the model that I would propose cannot be uh, adopted at the national level, and, and I'll just link with one final way back to data colonialism, there's no reason why it, we can't think of it in terms of the kind of transnational models of cooperation that started to emerge in the kind of post bandom era, where you had data being held by multiple jurisdictions. So I think that the, that the model here is a, it's a, it's a concept that has um, a number of different levels upon it with, in which it can be operationalized. Okay, wonderful. Um, so thanks so much for these really um, enlightening remarks. So what I'll do is I want to kind of pull this back a little bit and connect it to some of the panels and discussions that happened this morning. And I'll put three team themes on the table and then maybe I'll ask each of you a question and open it up. Um, so what I heard is very much a question of ownership, right? Um, so Ulysses was basically laying out the problem of how ownership, how, how kind of appropriation over data occurs and happens de facto on the ground, right? Through this lens, this interpretive lens of colonialism. And then we had Aziz talking to us about perhaps shifting through law, through regulation, shifting the default of ownership. And, you know, in a landscape where private companies tend to de facto appropriate data, created, generated, control it, how do we shift that default in line with the public interest toward the benefit of the public um, and kind of broader polities potentially? Um, and so maybe there are a few questions. One question is how do we think about ownership and rights as kind of um, relating, cutting across each other um, it was interesting to me that as you saw the ownership not necessarily as a right question. Um, I think a lot of people would think of ownership as a rights question. And I think this kind of raises a broader question about why do we always talk in terms of rights? Lawyers tend to use rights as their currency for you know, what legal regimes are doing, what the law is. It's a system of rights and entitlements. Um, but there are, of course, lots of different ways of thinking about rights. And so one way of understanding the right to information is as a kind of broader language for thinking about a political entitlement um, or um, arrangement for how to govern relationships over data, right? Um, but if we think about it in a more granular way, if we think about the data trust, if we think about um, ownership at a more kind of um, low level local perspective scale, um, we might actually start um, considering legal rights, existing regimes that allocate um, certain entitlements to various actors. And there are many different regimes already in place, right? There is 
privacy law, data protection law that kind of governs entitlements in a variety of ways. Um, one can think about free speech and the First Amendment as also another mechanism through which certain entitlements over data access and information access are already kind of come about. Um, and um, of course, property rights are one way of thinking about data. Um, it's, you know, they're puzzling. It's complicated to think about data in terms of property. But this is something that I'm really interested in hearing perhaps um, the two panelists think about a little bit more. Um, and, you know, and then there's questions of, you know, what is a right? Is it based on, say, sort of will of the individual? Is it an individual thing? Is it, can it be a collective language that just kind of um, tells us something about broader interests and how they coalesce um, under the law? Um, so all this is kind of under the umbrella of rights and what is a right to information. There's a second kind of cross-cutting theme, which I think is, um, you know, how do we think about a right to information as fitting within a broader political theory of justice, right? So in the panels this morning, we heard a lot of discussions around transparency, accountability, um, and perhaps we can add democracy here. And I think some of the questions that we can address here are, you know, information access, why and for whom? Um, who are these rights? Who are these um, mechanisms of access um, enabling, legitimating? If we think about a more historical arc of where things have gone in the last, say, 30 years, we have an initial kind of status quo of libertarianism, where it was very much a land grab, right, a data grab. Um, and we were just discussing over lunch about this kind of shift in 2018 when companies started using a language of transparency and accountability and saying, we want to be publicly motivated private actors. We're going to do some self-regulatory things that are going to align with the interests of the public. Um, but it was very much a sort of private governance discourse. And so it's interesting how people who think about um, researcher access to data saw that moment as an optimistic moment. Many of us thinking about regulation thought of that moment as a very sad moment. It was a moment where tech companies were trying to grab and kind of legitimate their own pre-existing ownership and entitlements over data through the language of democracy and transparency, right? And now if we look at the situation today, there is increasing amounts uh, or there are increasing amounts of regulation popping up in the United States and Europe everywhere. Um, in the US, I think in particular, I think of antitrust uh, enforcement and kind of more broader regulatory schemes. And in light of these schemes, what we're seeing is a sort of retraction and enclosure by companies of their data. And so we're seeing a sort of difficult landscape um, for researchers trying to access public information or information that is owned and possessed by companies, right? And so there's this kind of interesting tension between how we understand the broader kind of arc of what's going on and then this question of information access. Um, and finally, last theme is how do we govern data access, right? So having taken into account these questions of rights and taking into account these questions of how access relates to broader regulatory um, goals, um, you know, are we satisfied with things that are currently in place? And Lisa was mentioning at the start of this event, the Canadian Online Arm Harms Act, um, the European Digital Services Act, the US Platform and Account uh, Accountability and Transparency Act, Aziz mentioned public data trust, there are so many other mechanisms to govern um, the right to information data access. And, and so, um, you know, one question is what tools should we be thinking about and introducing? So one question, um, primarily perhaps to start with for, for Ulysses, but probably for both of you is um, this metaphor of data grab as land grab tells us something about what data is. It tells us data is like land. 
data is something that is appropriable, that is out there, that kind of gets appropriated. And so somehow there is a sort of assumption already that data is property-like, that property is the correct lens for thinking about data. And I guess that also relates to the data trust in the sense of it's all about ownership and entitlements over data as an asset. And so I'm wondering if you think, well, what is data? Is it a thing? Is it an asset? Is it something that's property-like? Or, or how else might we, might we want to think about data? Yeah, yeah. Those are all great questions. And I think um, what Nick and I try to do in our work is actually be very careful about establishing this neat equation one-to-one -one land equals data because we actually say it's not obviously it's not right data is not land uh, so what we hope the model of data colonialism can contribute is not so much that equation to just say data equals land or land equals data but to focus our attention on the process of extractivism uh, which i think you know that's uh, um, uh, the key question here uh, and I think that question can help us then answer other questions, such as the question of who is entitled to rights. Um, it was interesting to see, for instance, that in recent uh, conversations about the EU's uh, AI Act, uh, again, it was set up in a way that it guarantees certain rights to citizens. But for instance, when it comes to immigrants, it's like, no, screw you, you have no rights. Uh, we can extract all of the data that you know we want. Uh, uh, if you're trying to cross a border. Um, so I think uh, uh, that would be sort of my, you know, uh, counter question. Uh, does the right to information stop extractivism? I think uh, the right to information can help us understand how extractivism works, but uh, we need to go back and pay closer attention to it. Uh, because even to go back to your point, even defining a collective public good, if we don't address uh, that original question of extractivism can be problematic. I'm thinking of national parks here, right? The land was stolen and then some of that land was declared a national park and then we all feel good about it because we can enjoy the benefits except for the you know, people whose land was stolen. So uh, even this uh, definition of a public uh, good, I think needs to be uh, uh, unpacked from, from that perspective. I, I can say something about rights and something about why, about what, what property is. Two small topics. <laughs> I think when people use the term rights, they have in mind a legal category that has a couple of different qualities. I think one quality is generally uh, notwithstanding the existence of collective rights under both international law and at least other jurisdictions, including Canada's uh, basic law, um, rights tend to be conceptualized first as ind individual, uh, and second, they tend to be conceptualized as uh, indefeasible. Right? A, a right is, in, in Ronald Dawkins' famous terms, trump against majoritarian preferences. And, and this individual indefeasible concept of a right I think clearly has uses. Um, um, it's not the only concept of a right. For example, the legal theorist uh, Wesley Hofeld about 100 years ago came up with a much more complex and richer conceptualization of the different uh, permutations of legal relationships I think is arguably more helpful than the simple binary that I just set out. Um, but I don't, I don't find either the Hofeldian or the Dworkinian approach to, to rights helpful in thinking about questions of data. Um, I do think property is a useful uh, lens, um, in, in part because property is not necessarily a, uh, 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 a relation modeled upon the concept of a, what I would characterize um, as a liberal right. I think that the concept of a right that I just, I just put on the table derives from the liberal political tradition. Um, it's true, there is a, a, a liberal conception of a right. So there's a famous um, treatment of that by C.B. McPherson in terms of the, the concept of uh, possessive individualism. But that's not the only way of thinking about and conceptualizing and operationalizing the concept of property. Um, I think of property as the suite of legal tools that we have 
to regulate the relationship between two or more people, A and B, with respect to something X. So property is not about how to A and B relate to each other. It's how to A and B navigate their relations to something, whether it's tangible or intangible, that's separate from them. And there's a wide variety of ways in which that management or governance problem can be organized. Absolutely, there is the quintessential liberal model that is, you know, finds its roots back in Locke, uh, but that is celebrated, I think, most acutely in the uh, economics and the law and economics literature today. But there's also a set of, uh, of models of what property is that are rooted in pre-feudal understandings of collective entitlements, uh, of access to commons. That's a set of ideas that existed in medieval law. Um, the Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, Eleanor Ostrom, has demonstrated that there are, in many, many places in the world, legal regimes that manage A and B's relationship to X in terms of a collective property regime that does not suffer from tragedy of the commons problems. So the, uh, the, I, I think the idea of property is sufficiently capacious for us to, uh, to see that there is room for maneuver between individual between, and collective models, uh, between models that, that aim toward uh, productive efficiency i.e. how do you make sure that the asset is being used to generate the most welfare, or uh, models that, that uh, aim toward distributive justice, uh, models that aim toward the preservation, say, of some minimum standard of access or entitlement or welfare on the part of individuals, or that address questions of historical injustice that Ulysses just put on the table, right? You, you can absolutely have a system of collective uh, management under the name of property that is designed around the fact or, or that recognizes the fact that uh, there are both temporally antecedent claims and uh, temporally superseding claims of, of later generations of people that pertain to the same resource and the, and the job of the property regime, the task that the law is trying to solve, is the task of mediating between those two sets of competing, competing claims. So I think of property as being a much more plastic and a much more open textured set of ideas than rights. And within the, the historical tradition of thinking about property, Without re rejecting or saying that you know it's that the, there is no such thing as the liberal tradition of property, I think there are other traditions, and I think that that's where I would find value and inspiration for thinking about data today. Okay, great. So before opening it up, I'm going to ask another quick question, which is a question of incentives, and it's primarily directed at Aziz, but I'm you know if Aziz wants to add something which is when you think about the data trust and this kind of shifting the default um, to the general public, you're saying at a local level in particular, you want any generation of data, any activity that is based on data to be possessed on behalf of the state as a beneficiary, right? That's kind of the legal framework that you're thinking through. Um, and I guess the pushback from a lot of people might be Will that create sufficient incentives for actors to build businesses that um, generate information that might be valuable to the public? How do you create incentives um, for data generation? I, and is I, that I, even I, an issue, I guess? Yeah, I thought you were going to ask a different incentive question, which is, um, why would we ever think that uh, a legislature or a democratically elected body has the incentive to do something that does not just create a benefit today, but that has ongoing benefits in the, into the future, right? And this turns out to be a problem across different fields of regulation. For example, why, you know, what, under what circumstances does a national jurisdiction, uh, does a national, national legislature enact legislation that addresses the risk of financial crisis, right? Which doesn't just benefit that legislation those legislators today, it has some kind of durable effect, right? 
or climate change, exactly the same problem of time inconsistency. Right, so, so I, I thought that's where you were going, um, and I, I actually want to recognize that as a really important question. Right, it, it, and it's a problem built into democracy organized around elections. Um, elections create short time horizons. Short time horizons are inconsistent with legislative projects that are meant to create durable public goods. But the flip side is sometimes people get freaked out by something that happens and they respond to the thing that freaks them out by passing durable legislation. This is how legislation to address financial crises gets resolved. This is Dodd Frank and the like. So I, I think that the the sort of the, the, the important one of the the, le, the the incentive problems is 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 answered in part by that dynamic. I, I and as in the financial regulation context, I think that the public trust for data uh, concept requires a legal design that addresses actually your um, this question of ex ante incentives to create data um, uh, without. Um, uh, suppressing the public goods that can be produced through the data. And I, I, once one sees the parallel to things like financial regulation, I think that the, I think that the answer is there has to be some space in which you can generate a fair return, whatever you think fair means, right? Sufficient, maybe fair means sufficient to create an incentive to build, right? Accounting for the risks um, without stifling the ability of the public as a whole acting through its legislative uh, uh, channel to impose limits on undesirable uses, undesirable but profitable uses, and also to mandate the public production of public goods. Anything to add? Okay, so I'm going to open it up. Uh, yes. I, I might slip in with the first question. Oh, yeah, sorry. Sure. I have my... Um, I, to, jumping off your, your last question, Electra, I'm wondering if it's important to consider um, production prior to questions of ownership and use. Um, I, I mean, is the answer really less about access and the right to information and more so uh, data minimization if we're understanding data as some sort of uh, artificial abstraction that's making legible something that's useful to, to businesses, especially in the platform context? and how uh, a tension between data minimization um, might intersect with the right to information um, and access to justice in terms of these questions. But maybe that question is also obviated if the beneficial owner of the data is something like the public as opposed to uh, a private actor. I, I want to concede an important point that's implicit in what you said, which is that there are species of data that ought to be destroyed or extirpated because they're either they have no positive public use or the risks associated with such data are greater uh, by order of magnitude than the benefits. So uh, with uh, a colleague, Rebecca Wexler, uh, who's now at Berkeley, uh, I did a paper last couple of years ago on the regulation of, or the use of digital data to enforce uh, abortion-related restrictions post ops and both Rebecca and I are pro-choice, and the article takes a pro-choice perspective, just stipulates that we are pro-choice, and we're going to write about this from a pro-choice perspective. And, and I, I think that there are some species of locational data, there are some species of health-related data produced by, for example, period tracking apps, that although there are some public regarded uses with respect to health, they have such a risk of producing harms to, to people's access to reproductive care that they ought to be destroyed. And so I do think that there is a category of, of data where there is where the, the risk of harms are so great that it should not be allowed to exist. But I think generally, uh, the, I, I think that's an exceptional case. But I think in general, um, where you ended up, which is, look, the state's going to balance it and you're going to have some general regime that says, do, do this and you can't do that. And those general rules are going to have to be enforced in specific instances, either by some sort of non butman or some sort of third party uh, rights of action. I, I think that's, that, will have, that will be how that will play out in the general course of things. Um, I want to ask about the universal human right of freedom of assembly and association. 
in this context, and in particular, challenge the idea that, uh, at least uh, Z seemed to imply, that uh, the government, local, state, federal, was going to be the locus of these trusts and these responsibilities, as opposed to distributing that to any group uh, such that you can choose your uh, trust governance mechanism or, or that entity the way you would choose a union or choose a congregation in a religious sense, etc. cetera. Uh, it, that, that's the question. I guess mostly to you. Um, so I guess the, the 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 model that you're suggesting is a kind of marketplace of trusts, and you go into you you have a, you 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 or a marketplace of escrows maybe, um, where uh, there are eight or nine companies that say we will we will take a, take the beneficial ownership right of your data, and we will. Uh, we will manage it to, to, to your benefit. Um, I, I think that I, I, this is akin to the Posner Weil model. Um, uh, Eric and Glenn have this something like this this idea in mind in their book, Radical Markets. And, and their argument is look, this is going to generate, I mean, it's sort of a, it's a quintessential neoliberal argument. There's competition, ergo, there is innovation, ergo, there is increased welfare. Um, I, I think I resist that, those models for uh, two reasons. Uh, so uh, one is I'm skeptical whether one conceptualizes the entities as companies or you analogize them to unions or churches, trying to block the kind of, I think, inevitably commercial way in which this will play out. So I think that your metaphors are, are a little tendentious, if I can be, <laughs> if I can push the question, push back the question a bit. I, I think that those entities, um, I think that, that as a practical matter, people will not have the information to make good judgments as between those entities. And that, that is still asking a great deal of, of people. I, I think about, um, you know, how do you think, I, I, when, I, mean, I can't use this example for myself, but, but let's say somebody who is using a period tracking app in 2017 or 2018, you know, how are they, are you expecting them to think about what happens in 2022 20, um, when the Supreme Court overrules Roe v. Wade and suddenly all of their data historically becomes really valuable and potentially becomes inculpating to them, right? That's an awful lot of, awful lot of, of, of epistemic strain. Um, so I, I think that individuals can't choose. And the second reason I would resist it is is I, I'm, I think that you can account for, as Alexa said, uh, um, the need to generate private incentives with respect to innovation, um, while also capturing um, the possibility of generating public goods from data through a public trust. And I think that the mo kind of models you're describing, you can't really do the generation of public goods through data. Right, unless you have some sort of obligation on the part from the government onto the the escrows to use data in ways that generate public goods, but then you're just moving the model all the way over to what I'm describing. You're moving it so close to what I'm doing that it might you might as well do what I, I'm suggesting. I just want to add a tiny follow-up to this question, which is I think I think we often assume that humans live in this sort of legal vacuum where there's no sovereign and therefore it's all about individuals picking and choosing the authority that will control various assets. But in fact, we live in jurisdictions where we have a sovereign, the sovereign is the state, right? And, or we live in a state of affairs where companies are the default actors that predetermine when data is created and who possesses it and who controls it and who has access to it, right? And I, and so I think we need to operate uh, with those kind of preset defaults in mind when we're thinking about what kinds of regimes we want, right? And 
I think the, the distinctions between the kind of regime that you were thinking about and maybe what Aziz was thinking about are not as different in fact if you start realizing that you know the state doesn't necessarily control in significant ways or there are privacy guarantees or there are ways of opacifying information or um, there are ways for individuals to opt in or out of various schemes but perhaps the default mechanism should be governance in the public interest rather than governance through de facto data graph, right? Can, can I ask this question of Ulysses? Because mm -hmm. I think that there's a question that, that of this variety where like this, essentially where this, this tri trilogy of comments is going is to, to put it in really facile terms, the choice between the public and the private. Right? And, and, and the choice between corporate versus state mechanisms for decision making. And so I, I wonder how, how does one think about that in the context of, of post-colonial, the actual post-colonial regimes that we have. So we were talking in the lunch break about how um, post-colonial, is, is it really a post, I did you count Mexico, it's, Mexico is not really post-colonial. Maybe. True. Hard, hard, <laughs> uh, right. So hard definitional question. Um, but there are many post-colonial regimes where there's there's a, there's a resource, right? Mm -hmm. And the resource, you know, quintessentially becomes a curse rather than a blessing because the government it can't control itself from exploiting the resource, you know, through in collaboration with external mm -hmm. companies. And in the process, you 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 got good governance, right? Right. And, and there's something of yeah. this, you know, in, 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 you know, African states where you have lots of oil, you know, the Congo, essentially the state's been destroyed. Yeah, we were talking a little bit about, uh, for instance, uh, whether we can talk about nationalizing data, um, which is something I've just written a short op-ed, uh, just as a thought exercise. Uh, but it is an interesting question, uh, nationalization as a post-colonial reaction. Uh, where countries like Mexico, for instance, after World War II, decided to nationalize their oil. Uh, as a way of saying, okay, foreign companies can no longer control this resource. This resource now belongs to the state and its exploitation should benefit the state. Uh, which brings us to this other important question about the relationship between uh, the corporation and the state. Because when we think about traditional forms of colonialism, we always think about them as state projects um you know colonization by spain or by england or by the dutch but there were always uh corporate state enterprises right i mean east india company or caso de la contratación de las indias in, in spain uh so uh it was always a state and um corporate corporation enterprise and i would say that today the sovereign the, the balance has shifted because the state now depends on corporations for data right uh, to, uh, they don't generate it uh, themselves and they can they don't have the power to process it and analyze it so i would say that today uh, uh, the sovereign is the, cor the corporation not so much the state and you know uh, i think that's a counter argument a little bit to your position because and I, to the original question that uh, i don't think cities are going to be i think it's a very interesting uh, project but they're not going to be able to do enough i i see this uh, the process of decolonizing data as a global project that um, incorporates civil societies from uh, uh, all nations because uh, yeah uh, uh, Los Angeles or New York is not going to be able to stand up to Meta or Google. Okay so we're we are out of time. Um, I love how the panel on justice moved to a panel on decolonization of data which I think is very topical so um, I want to thank our, our two panelists and thank you, Lisa, and I'll, I'll pass the mic back to you. Thanks for a great panel. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to all of our panelists and moderators. Uh, thank you to everyone who attended here in person and online. And a huge thank you to the staff at Rebooting Social Media, um, those of you who are here doing the work today, but also the people who uh, made this happen um, on the many days of planning. And a thank you to the Short Treatment Institute for Technology and Society for co-sponsoring this. Thank you very much. Um, and 
uh, conversation can continue. There is uh, refreshments. Are they, are they out there? Or, yeah. Um, uh, uh, and so you're welcome to stay, um, have some refreshments, and um, you know, uh, follow up on any of the questions that you do get a chance to ask. So thank you.